Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. And yes, not a retread, right? Not a retread, a brand new fresh one that's being recorded for you because I love talking about this next thing. We are now talking about the Reign of Terror, right? Which a lot of y'all seemed a little bit confused about when we were going over this stuff, right? We were talking about it. Look, if you need to come swing by during, uh, like, not lunch, because I want to eat and I want to hang out, I want to be a normal human being, but, like, if you want to come swing by during, like, S period or something like that, and, like, kind of rediscuss the fact that, like, you know, after the September massacres and after the storming of the Tuileries on August 10th, 1792, and all this other stuff going starts going down, how they actually got from having a monarchy and, like, this old-school conservative thing with Louis and all this other stuff, and then ended up in this republic where they're just killing people left and right and all this other stuff, right? If you need to come talk about that, Come on in and talk about that, right? We can totally go over it. We can totally talk about counter-revolutionaries and how they're revolting and blah, 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 blah. And then we can also get into all this stuff as well. Planned economy, like emergency socialism and the lead into the reign of terror, right? But the big thing that you need to remember is delineate those facts that you need to know versus the ones that are like smaller little things that I use to just kind of keep telling the story, right? So the big thing about it though is let's get straight into it. Now talking about the reign of terror, right? From 1793 to 1794, the time period that is is going to be involved when Maximilian Robespierre, Jean-Paul Marat, and Georges Danton are basically leading over the entirety of the French government, right? They're leading over it using a small committee inside of the National Convention, right? The committee that they run inside the National Committee or National Convention is known as the Committee of Public Safety. Now, Marat was all, both on the Committee of Public Safety and also on the Committee of Treason, and we'll get to that whole thing here in a hot second, all right? But the big thing about it, though, is the Reign of Terror is a series of, like, trials. It is an era. It is a year and a half's worth of time, okay? year and a half's worth of time where what's going to end up going down is those three men, their committee, the Montagnards, and the most violent of the violent are going to be ruling over the French government. One of the very first things they do is they begin a series of trials, right? Where they put Girondinists on trial, nobles on trial, and all these other different figures on trial, and they rule with dictatorial power, right? The series of trials, what we're getting at with that is that there were these massive revolutionary tribunals that were going on during the Reign of Terror. They were huge public spectacles. Sans culottes members were invited to come and drink and throw food at the people being accused of their treason against the people of France, right? They hunted down the enemies of the revolution. This whole thing and these trials of revolutionary tribunals are going to lead to the execution of some 40,000 people in France, right? 40,000 people who will mostly be executed with this bad boy, right? This bad boy that you've never seen in action until now. Yeah, that's gross, right? Now, the big thing about it, though, is that is, of course, the guillotine, right? With Louis the Sixteenth being, like, one of the fourth people to ever be executed via the guillotine and stuff like that, it is a device that was brought in that apparently represented the Reign of Terror. Why does it represent the Reign of Terror? Why does this thing represent the Reign of Terror? I hear some of y'all right now, so I was like, because it's scary. Like, like, yes, it is scary, but there's another big reason behind it, right? It represented the Reign of Terror, apparently, because it was egalitarian, right? Go ahead and write that word down. The guillotine apparently was the egalitarian symbol of the Reign of Terror. Maximilian Robespierre and Georges Danton, one of his buddies, believed, of course, Sophie Pansbeck, you remember, Georges Danton's just a buddy of Maximilian Robespierre. He comes in at this point, he's actually helping rule the Committee of Public Safety. He's like his right-hand man when it comes to the politics stuff. And Jean-Paul Marat is like their newspaper writer, right? Now, looking at the entire thing, why would Maximilian Robespierre and Jean-Paul Marat and Georges Danton believe that this thing is egalitarian? Well, first of all, you got to understand what the word egalitarian means. Egalitarian, E-G-A a-L-I-T-A-R-I-A-N, I think. All right, so now look, what it means is equal, right? The idea behind it is that it kills with the same swiftness, whether you are rich or whether you are poor. And it apparently is considered painless, right? Now, the thing about it, though, is, is that a guillotine would pop up in every major city in France, right? Every major city in France would get its own guillotine. And like I said, this scene from The Devil Wears Prada... Literally, that scene takes place where the guillotine sat in Paris, right? And near that, like, fountain and right there in the Palace de Concorde is what actually that area is called, right? Now, the thing about it, though, in general, is the guillotine sat up on this big scaffold and people were invited to come and watch these executions, right? Invited to come and watch these executions because they believed that it would help scare off 
counter-revolutionaries. Now, we'll get to that whole thing here in about two seconds, okay? But the way the entire device worked is this little thing right here actually lifted up, right? And you would be tied to it like you saw in the clip, lowered down, head in the, in the stock, cut down, wham, head falls in basket, you're flipped into a, a basket coffin on the other side, body is then exported, and then you move on. At these things, the women would be invited to bring their children and like watch the guillotine executions have to take place. They would knit in the crowd and eat their meals and stuff while watching the executions of noble figures and people that had scorned France for all these time periods leading up to this point had actually died and lost their noggins. Also, this is my favorite thing, children were given little miniature toy versions of them to go home and play with and stuff like that because it was considered the image of the reign of terror right now big thing about it though getting back to what we were just saying so two seconds ago counter-revolutionaries who are these people right so a counter-revolutionary who a counter-revolutionary is during this era would be somebody that has grown sick of the revolution right they are like whoa 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 things are way worse now than they ever have been they were worse now than they were when we had louis these things are terrible we are we, like we're killing people in the streets i just want to go grocery shopping you know what i mean like so the big thing about it, though is you're going to see certain cities begin to break away and stuff like that places like toulon in southern france is going to break away and actually believe themselves to be different and they're gonna start trading with Britain and they're gonna start doing all these other things and they're gonna scorn the revolution and ironically enough a very famous guy went in and took over that city for Maximilian Robespierre and Dan and killed a bunch of people that lived there his name was Napoleon Tuttle if you want to understand that little like connection right there come in and chat with me and we'll talk about it a little bit extra okay but the big thing about it though in general is this use was used to help stop those counter-revolutionaries right because if every major city has a guillotine in it and you understand what will happen to you if you go against the revolution it's a way to make people get on board with the reign of terror, right? You understand what I'm saying? Keep them from like bucking back against it and stuff like that. And so the thing going forward that you also need to understand is that, what, what are we doing? Why is it zoomed out? Why did you do that? That is weird. All right, so there we go. The Jacobins though, are also gonna come in and begin to do a lot of very aggressive stuff. So the reign of terror is being led directly by Maximilien Robespierre, Georges Danton, uh, like Jean-Paul Marat, and a bunch of other people, Mirabeau, and like a bunch of other figures in the French Revolution are also a part of this, but you don't need to know them. You only really need to know Robespierre more than anybody else, right? And they, of course, were a part of that Jacobin Club, right? Or the Jacobin Club. They also are going to come in, though, and start doing some wildly aggressive things. They're going to actually begin to suppress women's rights, right? Like, so they come in and they're like, oh, we cannot allow women to be a part of these clubs and things like that. Women would be beat in the streets during the Reign of Terror, told like, it's very weird. We're abandoning the values of the revolution at this point, right? You're going against women's rights that women fought so hard to get. Like Olympe de Gaulle, like literally came out with that entire thing, the Declaration of the Rights of Women, right? And then she is going to be guillotined during the Reign of Terror, right? She's going to be executed for trying to incite women to join political clubs and be too aggressive, right? Also, the only colors you were allowed to wear during the Reign of terror were red white and blue and if you like reference back to that clip or whatever the guys that are guillotining that lady are all wearing red white and blue right also they're gonna do all this crazy stuff to try and basically abandon the old france right they changed how time was kept this right here is a time piece from the reign of terror notice it doesn't have an 11 or 12 the hours are different the time the way time is being kept is different and they only have 10 hours in every single half of the day. It's very, very strange, right? And then also on top of everything else, they changed how time was kept. Units of measurement were changed. The calendar drastically changed. I don't know if I still have that thing up here anywhere really, really quick, but this is like literally the French Republic calendar, which still had 12 months, but then it somehow only had like 30 days every month and stuff like that. And then it also was done by like the seasons and everything else. It's very, very weird how they actually changed the entire thing up. But literally, and they also started their entire dating system over, right? They literally were like, oh yeah, they changed the names of all the months of the year. They were like, oh, blah, 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 and, blah, 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 and like croissant and like all these other weird names for all the days of the month. And each of the months had 30 days, right? Like, so it's a very, very weird one. This one, right? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? This one right here is going to become very important. Remember that name, Thermidor, right? Like, so now, like, it actually means, like, the hot month, right? Because it actually takes place from mid-July to mid-August, right? So the interesting little thing about it, though, is they're changing everything. They're trying to abandon the old France. They're going to be like, no, we also are going to change the way we keep our dates and stuff like that. They restarted the years because when the revolution began in 1789, after the reign of terror starts up, they're like, no, it is no longer 1789. It is now year one. Right, like so, yeah, I know. Like they actually like started up a whole new dating system. They were like, oh, this is year one. Next year will be year two, and the years of the republic. Right. So like now, when we're looking at it as well, not only are they going to change all that stuff, but then they're also going to try and 
de-Christianized the entire area. That's right! Maximilian Rosebeer, George Dan, Jean-Paul Marat even abandoned Christianity, right? They abandoned Christianity, and they instead replaced it with a new national religion called the Cult of Reason, right? They actually closed Notre Dame for a time, and they wanted to turn it into a shopping mall, right? They were doing all this other crazy stuff going into it, and the reign of terror is just absolutely wild. Now, some people are still existing and doing all this other stuff. Famous figures like, for example... This guy right here, Jacques-Louis David, who was a very, very famous painter who actually lived in the area of the French Revolution in Paris nearby the entire time. He eventually becomes Napoleon's court painter and stuff like that, and he actually documented a lot of the different things that were going on. And then one of the biggest things he noted was that nationalism was exploding. Nationalism was blowing up everywhere and stuff like that. And also there began to be this draft of all unmarried men into the military to fight all these coalition wars that the French are all fighting against Austria and Prussia and now Russia and places like that, right? And in all this chaos, in all this ridiculousness, he continues to paint, right? And one of the most famous events he painted in 1793, in 1793, July 1793, was the death of Jean-Paul Marat. That's right, during the Reign of Terror, Jean-Paul Marat died. And guess what's going to happen to the other guys? Spoiler alert, they're going to die too. So what ends up going down, though, is this is a really big event for me, right? This is a very big event for me to talk about because, one, I love this piece of art. It's in Belgium. I can't wait to go see it one day. I'm hoping to go see it this summer and stuff like that. But the big thing about it, though, is Jacques-Louis David, the painter, painted this painting known as the Death of Marat. Because in 1793, he documented this event when Jean-Paul Marat was stabbed to death in his bathtub, right? Now, Jean-Paul Marat was on the cult, or not the cult, was not the cult of uh, reason. Jean-Paul Marat was on the Committee of Treason, right? And he used to use his newspaper, like the friend of the people, and he would write lists of names of people that needed to be arrested and brought to the guillotine every single day whenever he would issue his newspaper and stuff like that, however often he did it. And the thing about it was, is coupled with all these different ideas, the Girondin sympathizers are still out there. People are beginning to grow tired of this, right? Well, the reign of terror, when it, by the time it was like six to seven months in, people were like, dude, this is not what we had planned on. You're suppressing women's rights. You're taking people's freedoms away from them. You got rid of Christianity. You're doing all this other different stuff. You changed my months. You changed my time. All this other crazy things are going on. And so people are beginning to get upset. And then one day, this woman showed up, and her name was Charlotte Cordray, right? Like, so like Charlotte Corday, or excuse me, Corday, all right, so C-O-R-D-A-Y. Charlotte Corday rolls up and asks to have a meeting with Jean-Paul Marat, right? She says, I want to have a meeting with you. I want to discuss with you some people that I believe are a part of this treasonous act. Jean-Paul Marat says, okay, you can come meet with me, but I'll be in my bath because I have to sit in my medical bath for six hours a day because of the skin disease I got from living in the sewers, right? And then literally during that meeting, while he is writing names onto that list, she pulls out a knife and stabs him to death while he's in his bathtub seven or eight times in his chest and he bleeds out into the bathtub and the water was stained red with his blood and to this day do y'all remember when we talked about the like march like the women's march on versailles and stuff like that remember i told you remember this piece of paper that right there was the copy of the piece of paper that he had in his hand all this right here, that is Jean-Paul Marat's blood. Ugh, I know, it's absolutely wild, right? That right there, that is him sitting there bleeding into his bathtub and dying. So what is this showing us? That people are beginning to grow tired of this. What happened to Charlotte Corday as well? Also guillotine. She actually stood there and waited to be arrested, right? And when they had her on the stand in one of these revolutionary tribunals during the Reign of Terror, Maximilian Rose Pierre was there, and the adjudicator asked her, what do you say? for your counts of murder, for your counts of treason. What do you say for yourself, young lady? And she goes, I killed one man to save a thousand, right? Like, so, like, as you can see, this is a big event because people are beginning to get fed up with this, right? Right after that, too, Marie Antoinette is going to be guillotined as well on charges of assaulting her son. Remember we talked about this, how they were torturing her son in front of her and stuff like that? She had a terrible way of going out. Not only that, but then they also told her son one day, you are going to go into this revolutionary tribunal. You're going to tell the people and the jury that your mom physically assaulted you and sexually assaulted you when you were young or we're going to kill your sisters, right? So like now, and so what he did is he gave in and he did it. 
and then they end up executing Marie Antoinette. She wore pauper's clothes to the guillotine. They shaved her head, her very, very, very crisp blonde hair that was so, so light, it was almost white, right? Her beauty was stricken from her. Years of stress was on her face, and this disgusting thing happened. And this woman who stood on the scaffold probably could have stood up there and been like, you know, I hate all of you. You're disgusting. I am not guilty of this, right? But her last words were not let them eat cake, which is a myth. She never actually said let them eat cake. If she would have said it at all, she would have said let them eat brioche. But actually Jean-Jacques Rousseau referred to brioche being rich people, rich people bread and stuff like that. And a rumor had started that she had said it, but she never actually said that. The real reason why, or the real thing she said before she was executed, she actually stepped on the executioner's foot. And the last words she ever said was, I'm sorry, excuse me. Like, so like, yeah. And then Marie Antoinette would be executed on Oct in October of 1793. So as you can see, things are going crazy, right? Things are going absolutely wild. They're really, really off the rails right now at this point. And then not only that, is it going on in France, the revolution in Saint-Domingue is blowing up as well. Now, the thing about it when we talked about it as well, like back in the day, or not back in the day, like in the last flip, when we discussed the revolution going on in Saint-Domingue, when we talked about how Haiti is like getting ripped apart by like slave revolts and stuff like that. Well, the thing about it was is that the like people, like the, the French people, the white French landowners and stuff like that, always had the ability to suppress the slave revolt because the slaves were not very organized or not militarily trained until this man shows up. Toussaint L'Ouverture. Toussaint L'Ouverture rose up and he actually was a slave that was self-educated, could read, could write, and actually studied the ways of Enlightenment thinkers and also of military campaigns throughout history. He literally organized the slaves into an army that had like proper uniforms and had like guns and things like that and used specific movements using the environment and terrain of Saint-Domingue and Hispaniola on the west side. Because remember, Hispaniola has two countries on it, Haiti and, and the Dominican Republic, and he he actually leads a slave revolt that starts in 1793 that is wildly successful, right? He also was so successful in it that the British and the French told Toussaint L'Ouverture, we'll make you officers in our army if you can take this island away from the French, right? Why would they do this? Because they want that island. They want the sugar and the coffee that is grown there, right? Well, the convention, because of this, Maximilien Robespierre is going to abolish slavery in Saint-Domingue. Why? to get Toussaint L'Ouverture to come back, which he did. He switched sides back to the French to fend off the British and Spanish. And what ended up happening is we'll talk about that even more a little bit later on. But slavery would be abolished in Saint-Domingue because this man, this one man, this phenomenal individual, Toussaint L'Ouverture, led a revolt that was organized, educated, intense, and perfect and actually won freedom for all of his people. How cool is that? You know what I mean? Like so, and he did this during the French Revolution. Absolutely wild. Now going forward as well though, we got one last thing to talk about, the Thermidorian reaction and the directory, right? This is that one little slide that we spent on the directory. Well, the big thing that ended up happening is, is that the like reign of terror just kind of kept rolling forward, right? Kept rolling forward. And during this whole process, now Jean-Paul Marat has been stabbed to death. He starts to get really, really paranoid that people are coming after him and stuff like that. Y'all ever met somebody before that's just like really, really paranoid and like really, really intense and over the top? The biggest thing about it is Rosemary grew really, really paranoid. And a lot of people started like criticizing him at different meetings at the National Convention and stuff like that. They start saying, Robespierre, do you have the best like intentions of France at heart? Do you have like the best ideas here? You're not even really listening to anybody anymore. You're just trying to kill everybody to keep the sans culottes happy. Well, one of the people he believed was coming for his power was his buddy, George Danton. He actually had George Danton executed, right? One of his closest allies. Following the execution of Danton, everyone is fed up with his crap, right? No one wants to see 40,000 people executed all over the entire country. They want to get back to neutrality. They want to begin to live their lives again. And people grew disgusted and tired of all the violence. So this event happened known as the Thermidorian Reaction. During that really hot month, right, during the month of Thermidor, a coalition of men got together in the National Convention and recruited other members of the National Convention and were like, we have to take down this new tyrant, right? And so what they decided to do is they created charges against Maximilian Robespierre and decided he would need to be the next one put on trial so they could bring peace to the revolution because they were sick and tired of all this stuff. They wanted to focus on the wars they were having. They wanted to keep winning, and they also were winning. So it was just kind of one of those things where they were like, we don't need to do this anymore, right? We don't need to walk around scared at any moment that he might come and arrest us and have us executed, right? So the Thermidorian reaction was an event where they went off 
and arrested Maximilian Robespierre, right? Maximilian Robespierre would be arrested during the Thermidorian reaction by other members of the National Convention. He would be put on trial as well. He actually, as you can see in this painting, they are holding the charges that they have against him. They stormed into his hotel room inside of Paris, and it was so wild and crazy that apparently when everybody looked up and all of like Maximilian Robespierre's buddies that are hanging out with him were like, oh crap, this is the end. One of them apparently jumped out of the window and committed suicide in that moment. Maximilian Robespierre apparently attempted suicide in that moment as well. It also, there's two stories to this. Apparently one of them is that Maximilian Robespierre took a gun, put it in his mouth, and when he was getting arrested, he tried to shoot himself, but somebody hit his elbow and the bullet came out of the side of his face, knocking out, like breaking his jaw and knocking all of the teeth on the left side of his face out, right? And so there's this giant hole inside of his face. He's bleeding out of it. He can barely stand up and stuff like that. That's what he said. He wrote down, he's like, I shot myself, right? But then a guy that was arresting him claims, no, I shot him. And the bullet went into his mouth and came out of the other side of his face. And this is what Maximilian Robespierre looked like when he was going to the guillotine. He was held on trial asked, while he was his entire face was bandaged up and he couldn't speak. They were like, do you have anything to say for yourself? He's like, mm -hmm. like so, and he couldn't even say anything whatsoever. And Maximilian Robespierre would be executed in 1794, right? In 1794, he'd be executed. And when he went up to be executed that day, this is a prominent political cartoon that was like released after his execution. They apparently asked him, do you have any last words? And they unbandaged his face and like took off the bandaging and his jaw just collapsed down. He was just like, ah, it just screamed in massive pain. He would then be executed and the directory would be established. Now the directory rose from the ashes of the Committee of, the Public, Committee of Public Safety. And what it was basically, it's as if, as if you had five presidents, right? It was a five man executive branch that had like semi-dictatorial power that had to work with the National Convention to pass laws and bring peace to the entire thing. But there's something that I need you to write down. The directory was phenomenally inefficient and very, very weak, right? And so, and last but not least, then next class, we're gonna start talking, talking about this guy, none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. But I'll see y'all then, y'all have a good one.